Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm glad you can join us here. As you might notice right off the bat, we're doing a slightly different format. We've moved over to Zoom meetings. Uh, part of the Zoom meeting, it allows us to do many more people. Um, we kept hitting the cap in the old webinar, Zoom, in a Zoom webinar, we can do a thousand attendees, so it gives us a lot more room. Um, also, it gives us a, bit, a little bit of better ability to have a camera and to show. So I'm stalling as normal, my first uh, 30 second stall, as there are a lot of participants joining. Um, but we're gonna jump right in here. I really appreciate everybody being on time and ready to roll. Um, how it's still ticking up pretty quickly. Um, cool, all right, let's go ahead and get started then. Well, welcome to tonight's webinar and training and coaching with WKO. Um, my name is Tim Cusick. I'm the Training Peaks product leader. I'm a master coach at Velocious Endurance Coaching and Basecamp. I'm a USA certified coach. I work with Training Peaks and WKO5. I'll be leading most of tonight's show. But along with me is my kind of partner in WKO Crime and the actual creator of WKO all the way back to the days when it was cycling peaks. Uh, through all the WKO iterations and to today, the driver behind WKO5, Kevin Williams. Kevin is playing the special role of color commentary tonight, but in future webinars, we're going to be flipping that around a little bit. Kevin gets to handle the more technical stuff. I get to handle the more process stuff. Hey, there, everybody. Hey, Kev. As we kick off in tonight's webinar, one of the things somebody asked me about tonight's webinar is how does it differ from what you have online or maybe recorded before? This really is about the process of coaching with WKO, coaching and training with WKO. I think what makes the difference uh, when you're on the live webinar is the questions and the Q and A. I have another screen going on over here. I am tracking Q and A very closely on this screen. I want you to ask questions as we go and then get engaged. I've broken the presentation down into a series of chapters. And at the end of each short chapter, I'm gonna stop and make sure that I answer all questions. Um, in general, I might, know, I might parking lot it and say it's coming up later, but I'm gonna answer all questions. All right, with that being said, I'm also gonna give one piece of background one of the things that Kevin and I have been having a lot of discussion about in the last month or so is how much discussion is still going on about the idea of FTP. Is FTP my one hour power? Is FTP, should I have it as 297 and a half watts or just round that up to 300? One of the things that's happened when you see these FTP arguments, right? FTP was something, an idea founded by Dr. Andy Coggin in the early 2000s and was an excellent way of taking data from a power meter and translating it into a simple estimation or estimate of your threshold. And then the entire power training system of that time was based on that single number spread out over the, across the ideas of like, uh, interval training, uh, workout targets, you know, power zones or power levels, right? Training zones or training levels. So it was really important that you super honed in on your FTP, which then over the past 18 years, as some of you might know, have sparked a whole lot of debates about what is FTP, what is this, what is that, right? It has certainly been a challenge over those of participating in those discussions. Is it one hour? Is it less? Is it more? What Kevin and I want to send to everybody is a message, and we're going to do a much better job in the Facebook group and these webinars. That's not even the right question anymore. The science, the technology, the data, the, the data availability, meaning different types of data and different uh, insights into the athletes by using data, we've evolved beyond, beyond FTP being just one number. The funny thing is when we designed WKL4, that was the entire goal was to unhitch people from just thinking about FTP and thinking about the entire power duration relationship that athlete has. That being said, um, it really needs to be understood as a process 
it needs to be understood as a physiological, as a scientific approach, and it needs to be understood as a art form, meaning do you understand the art? So the reason we're starting out with this process orientation, the new power duration coaching process, is we want to get everybody aligned behind the process because what we then see, like posts over the last week, you're already seeing it in our Facebook group, right? My FTP is just off, but my, I, this interval would seem wrong or that interval, my model doesn't work because I haven't tested in forever. Let's get back to the understanding. We're not hinging everything on FTP. When people say, I gotta have my FTP exactly right, I say that's just one metric and a bunch of other metrics. And if you're training right now, if you're listening to this webinar and you're still basing your training on FTP and setting your training levels, that's the old, right? That's old stuff. We need to evolve that, take advantage of all this science, computer horsepower, analytics, data that we have and evolve our training. So our goal over the next, between now and the end of the year is to really convince everybody that we need to adapt to a new process. Now I have to say, that's our opinion. We like this process. We think we vetted it, tested it, and a lot of people are using it well, but I'm not gonna have the FTP discussion one more time in 2021. There's my new year's resolution right now ahead of the game. It isn't gonna happen because I don't wanna be talking about FTP as a single access, a single point of balance of all your training. We're gonna be talking about power duration. That's the new trick. All right, let's jump into it with that little lecture in place that gave all the late joiners uh, time to join. Um, one of the things, just going, back through here if you're typing in chat we're not monitoring chat please use q questions if you have a question go ahead and ask your question sorry it's just too many things to look at and then it distracts in the webinar all right let's get rolling with a little overview um let's start with the overview of this whole idea of analytics right why analytics why are we looking at crunching all these numbers and data remember the first time you opened a wk4 or wk5 and get dashboard and you're like whoa data the reality is it's very, very simple. The use of data analytics, the whole idea of data analytics, of, of artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever you wanna call it, is to increase the odds of success. You're not a data science. You're not looking at this dashboard of all this data just to look at data, right? You're not that, you're not a data scientist. This isn't the science of data. This is the science of decision-making. Knowledge truly is power. The smarter we get about our athletes or ourselves and how we are, our ability to uh, score, create metric, analyze, predict athlete response to the training dose, the better we are. There's no perfect, there's no absolute, or we'd, if we had one system that worked perfectly for everybody, we'd all use that system. We'd all be really freaking fast, right? <laughs> and we'd be uh, having just worrying about training. This is all about increasing the odds of success. What's so funny is, if somebody said, there's a new aerodynamic frame out there and it's gonna give you 10 more watts or eight more watts and that's gonna increase your odds of success, people run and they spend $5,700 on that frame. Taking an hour or two or three to learn how to use data to increase your odds will probably get you a better return and save you a whole lot of cash. So that's my pitch, let's jump into it. Tonight, we're really here to talk about this evolution. And if I needed to summarize the evolution into one word, you've all heard me say it, is individualized training. And simply that's training that recognizes the unique physiology of the individual athlete, really, which allows you to be highly specific in your training, in your diagnostics, in, in your, your uh, metrics, in your prescription, and it improves your ability to be more efficient and effective with your athletes. It's really improving your coaching efficacy. It is making you more efficient. Why is that? Well, let's think a little bit about the journey of training, right? This evolution of training of WKO, which we really needed this accurate model to do, has gone from random training to generalized training to individualized training. And one of the words that we were thinking about this very early, and I got to give uh, Andy credit for this, it's this idea of having an individual training footprint. Once we understand your individual training footprint, we can really do a better job of training you. 
And what that means is, and I've said this a couple of times, and we'll get into more original stuff, but I got to repeat the basics again, because there's a lot of new people here. There's a lot of people on the webinar. Using the exercising athletes to better understand their physiology, and then using their physiology to improve training results via individualization and specificity. So the reality is, this is the core of the evolution. When Andy started, he created FTP, and he created TSS, and there was a lot of people involved in that. The whole idea was a better generalized approach, but everything was based on generalization. It really was. I'm going to give you a little more depth on that, some things that might surprise you later. Now the whole role has gone to individualization. So that's really the core of what we want to do with WKL4 and WKL5 is to give you a tool to allow you to individualize training. That tool, WKO is the software that delivers it. The power duration model or power duration curve is the tool. If you don't maintain that tool, you should not expect it to deliver, but we'll get into that. So let's just talk about the process and then get into the lessons. What we want you to walk away with these two webinars is a really good understanding of the power duration process. Once we have everybody at that basic learning level, we're going to be doing some more advanced stuff and kind of turn up the, the science and art side of it. This process can be broken down really into five steps, test, diagnose, plan, execute, and monitor. And each one of these have some elements underneath it. Testing is about establishing your power duration curve and training targets. Diagnose is about understanding your needs. Plan is about using that data to build a good plan. Execute is about building smart workouts around that data. And the idea of monitor is continual improvement. How we, and continual, improve, continual improvement doesn't necessarily mean your athlete continually improves. Maybe that's true. <laughs> but it means you as the coach or even the self-coached coach athlete, um, you continue to improve it. The more we learn about these performing athletes, the more we learn about the underlying physiology, the more we can improve our training effectiveness. Let's start with lesson one, which is the power duration curve testing protocols. This is like the hot topic. I've been answering questions like this and I'm, you know, on the Facebook group, it's hard to just be like, follow the process. And then people ask questions like, follow the process. So let's talk about what that process is. But to understand the core of where people have misunderstandings with the power duration curve, you have to go back to the why we built one. People believe we built one to predict power at various durations. We wanted to be able to say, if you just did a hard three minute effort and a hard five minute effort, we'd be able to predict your entire power duration curve. The critical power model, which is often compared to the power duration curve, was built to do that. It was, and it has certain elements and functions on it or as part of it. It wasn't just built to do that, by the way, that's not fair, but it really had that, that pointed direction to it. And it was meant to give you your CP, your critical power and, and your W. The reality is though, we didn't want to just to be able to do that with the power duration curve. As a matter of fact, being able to predict power at various durations is an incorrect answer. What we wanted to do was to be able to utilize a model to develop and quantify physiological attributes of the athlete. If you think about that power duration curve, you're really peeling back the athlete layer and you're looking at it in its most simplest way, how they make energy, right? And as we perform, that's highly relevant. All fatigue is biochemical, all performance is driven by some form of fueling, you have ATP turnover, Krebs cycle, all the basics that are out there in physiology. But when you look at the power duration curve, we wanted a curve that actually linked to those real physiological things. And that meant not only creating a power curve, but it meant making decisions like, and I know the math people will kind of get this, and I'm going to be a little vague because we still obscure how we did it. How many parameters does your model have? A low parameter model, let's call it a two parameter model, is easy to replicate. You could do that kind of on a head unit on your Garmin. You have enough power, horsepower in there. We needed more parameters because we needed something that was highly accurate 
and matched those parameters actually being physiological things within the athlete. Um, it's reasonably known we have a five parameter model. Um, so the reality is we have a fair amount of parameters out there all helping us get and uh, uh, derive a better physiological understanding of the athlete. So the goal of understanding these physiological parameters is that we wanted people to be able to have that data on themselves or their athletes without the need for formalized testing. How many times is people like, I go into a lab and I go into a lab and I go into a lab and I've seen arguments and I've gotten into them at times. I try not to, to fight on the internet, but I have where people are like, but in the lab, it's four watts different. And if I just go into the lab and I test that every month, those four watts are gonna be a pretty big deal. I'll give you two pieces of information on that. No, they're not. And two, who really has access? Which one of us listening to this webinar to get into the lab once a month and do a full VO2 max test or whatever they're doing? And the reality is those items, that learning doesn't actually impact your training any differently than the data from your power duration model. You would still change or edit or tweak your training. You're actually using the power data more to make those decisions than you would lab. So we just wanted to bring the lab to you, to bring it home and make it easier for people to have that data. So the physiological things are quantified energy systems ranging from you know, your Pmax, your anaerobic, aerobic power, aerobic endurance and stamina, things like that. We've kind of gone on that in depth, but understand that the model was meant to help us quantify physiological attributes. One of the things it gets us and gives us is a, uh, is a estimate, not a prediction of what you can do at power and what you should do at power, uh, you know, power targets in your training, which we're gonna get into, but it was really driven to make sure we had the underlying physiology correct to give you better information and then therefore allow us to build other things like eye levels and optimized intervals that specifically target those physiological systems. Notice how many people say I'm doing this interval targeting this physiology system or physiological, but they're not actually determining that system first. They're just saying, I think it targets it. What power duration metrics do we have? I'm not gonna get into this too deeply, but PMAX, FRC, MFTP, STAMA, and TTE are the direct ones. We have uh, modeled VO2 max, fiber type. We have an enhanced power profile, which we're gonna get into a little bit tonight. We have the elevation corrected power, which gets lost in the mix. And all of these spin around the ability to understand phenotype. One of the things Kevin said to me today, and I actually have a slide on it later, when you think about your power duration curve, right? It's not just the height. We get lost in the height because we always want more power. We want to be able to say I have 300 watt threshold or 1400 watt sprint, right? The shape of that curve is highly relevant to how you're going to improve your training and improve your performance. Where does that bring us to? Right back here. And that's how we generate that individualized footprint. We understand your physiology or the performing athlete's physiology first, and then we use that information to better train that athlete, right? That is the footprint. To get that out of the power duration model though, you have to feed the model. There's no way around it. I have this discussion 100 times every fall. <laughs> I'm having it right now. And I'll keep having it because I want people to learn and I appreciate people asking questions and getting into it but you have to have an accurate range of performance data. You need at least 30 days of data. It's pretty rare to find anybody these days without 30 days of power training you know, data, but you need at least 30, preferably 90. And you need one max effort in the short, medium, and long ranges. And we'll get into how you identify those shortly. Now, when it comes to the process of keeping your model maintained, there's two steps you need to know. First is, we do need a structured or a baseline testing format that should be done at the annual startup. I do mine at the same time every year, not maybe for all each one of my athletes has their time testing, you know, about the same two weeks of every year. And let's just for discussion sake for our Northern hemisphere, let's just say that's November, right? November one. So the reality is you should kick off every season with the same structured testing so that you set up your power duration models baseline numbers. That, you know, 
can also need to be done like if an athlete's injured and they've had an extended time off, maybe coming back from an injury, you don't want to test. So I shouldn't say that as an example. Let's just say they got really lazy <laughs> for a couple months. If they took two months off, I would baseline again and truly try to get that clean start. Once the baseline is established and we know the baseline's in place, all you need is simple unstructured testing an ongoing maintenance approach, which I'm gonna teach it to maintain. One of the discussions I was having on Facebook today is, and I see this happen time and time again, and people, um, to be honest with you, they blame the model and it's not really the right answer. You should blame the process, which I have not obviously done a, a good enough job of communicating to people. If you don't do the baseline test first, you end up chasing your normalized residuals, which if you don't know what that is, I'm going to show you, but you end up chasing, you end up testing more than you have to just to get your model kind of honed in. Where in the reality is once your model's kind of wacky, how's that for a science term? That's why you do the baseline at the beginning of the year. So you're not chasing the model through the first couple of months trying to get it honed and perfect. And then you can have a simple ongoing unstructured format that works. So let's dig into those a little, right? This is my initial structured testing format. I use it with all my athletes. I prescribe it, I'm prescribing it in the next couple of weeks. Um, and it is what it is. Uh, I do this in a testing week, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. So a five day testing in a seven day period. You can substitute maybe an extra day off in there if you really have to or something like that. Why is it so spread out? The power duration model requires max effort. Now, I totally understand there's people out there that have read different books that will say you should do a five minute hard interval and then a 20 minute test and then there's your FTP. I know you've read other books that have said do a 30 minute all out test and that will help you derive your FTP. So you end up with both of those tests taking 95% of your 20 minutes, or I forget what it is, 97% of your 30 minutes. I know other books that say do a three and an eight minute, and that's your FTP projected out, right? None of that matters here. In my opinion, we've evolved past that. Get your model up and running, understand your physiology and where you're at, and then just do unstructured training going forward. So the reason we spread this out over days is that the athlete needs a maximal effort. And yeah, even five days. That's why I'm saying if they need an extra day of rest in here because they gas themselves, that's okay. You want it to be in the same week, but you know, it really is four testing days. Day one is a five minute test, really good warm up, bash out five minutes, ride around at some low endurance and go home, right? Simple as that. Day two is where there's a little bit of complexity. You have to think about the athlete's phenotype or rider type, right? And it, when I explain this, it's inverse than your, your, your first uh, inclination might be. So if you're a very flat, typical curve, and you might not have used WK before, you might not even understand your curve. If you're not a sprinter, but a good diesel, you're a time trialist, right? Um, so if you're a diesel um, type of runner, a good time trialist, you only need 20 minutes. I'm gonna explain why in one minute. If you're an all-arounder or a sprinter, like if you have a really good five second pop, but will fade off by like 40 pretty hard, you need 25 minutes. If you're a really good pursuiter, if you're one minute power is super high, or two minute power is super high, you actually need 30 minute all out tests. So time trialist gets to go shorter, right? That's what's counterintuitive. You're like, well, the time trialist would be more comfortable going 30, probably true. But that's exactly why we have these different times. Because what you do want to do is make sure during this test that the athlete really burns off all of their anaerobic, uh, uh, let's call it capability, because I don't want to use capacity here, um, anaerobic capability, so that they have that anaerobic capability uh, out of the system. And we've given them enough time to really establish the model well. Once done, easy 20 minute roll around, cool down, head home. Next day, one minute test. Just bash it with a hammer, just crush it. People always ask me, well, should I do it standing, seated, this? Just go as hard as you can. Max is max. You know, as those of you who have been following for years, you know I've been saying max is max. When it's time to go max, go max. Same with a lot of intervals when you get ready to peak. Max is max. Um, 
rest cut day, and then some hit some sprints. That's your baseline test and will establish your model. I'm going to get into some model examples here in a moment. Once you've done that, you really just need ongoing unstructured tests. You can look at your uh, normalized, I always have to have a typo, at least one. You look at your normalized residuals and testing targets, which I have in the next slide, so I'm going to show you. But all you do need to do is look at those normalized residuals, pick out the low points in short, medium, and long, and test them over 30 to 90 days. I actually prefer like four to six weeks. And actually, I've become more disciplined, um, meaning what I mean by more disciplined is I try to do them every four weeks now because it blends into training. Also, one thing about unstructured testing, because it's unstructured and it's not 20 minutes every four weeks or five minutes every four weeks, the athlete mentally relaxes. Testing doesn't become such a mental strain. It just becomes a max effort. Hey, athlete Joe. Hey, athlete Jane. I just need you to go out and rock out a, a, a 65 second max, a, a, a 90 second max, whatever, right? That I think takes away some of that testing tension. That's made it easier for me to get into, um, get athletes convinced to test every four weeks. As you guys know, that's not always the easiest thing, right? And I have some great questions rolling in. I'm going to answer them in a couple of slides, so I'll get to you guys. Um, those testings don't need to be all in the exact time, exact day. They can kind of be, I rolling test them. Like I kind of think my short test early in a cycle, my longer test mid, because that's when they tend to be a, a little at the performance and my, my medium test in the third week. Blend them right into your workouts, make it work for you. This is a screenshot of the normalized residuals. I have one in my case study, which I'm gonna show you here in a moment. But what you're looking for is these are these low points. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there, right? Or easier yet, we actually point them out for you and give you a target. Now, I regret calling this power target and I've meant to correct this a million times and Kevin, you have to remind me to correct this one million more times. That's the minimal power target, meaning when I wrote it, when, when we put it together, it was meant to be what you're trying to go beyond. Where people are like, well, should I go out and do exactly 600 watts? That's kind of what it says in this 30 second one. I think I could read it. No, I want you to exceed that number, but it's my fault, bad wording on that. But you want to exceed that number. And what you're really doing is you're taking these low points in your normalized residuals and pulling them close. And I'm going to show you what that means in the power duration curve, but normalized residuals is a fancy math term for uh, distance from zero. Like if you think about your curve like this, right? How far away is your actual power, you know, the gap between your power duration curve and your mean max power. But I'll show you here on that slide, on the next slide. So what you have to do though here is all you're doing as a coach is once every four to six weeks saying, yeah, and if this one's this low, negative 10, I might pick that one. So that person needs about a 25 minute test. And then the next week I might have them do this one. And that one is about, I don't know, 95 seconds, whatever. Then this one, I think you get the point. How does that play out in a power duration curve? Well, here looks is a pretty clean one, even with this little odd jump, but I picked this because this is the best way right here. If you can kind of hone in the spot, this would be a very low normalized residual. That's where the power duration line is above your actual mean max power by a noticeable gap. So another way you can do it, and if you, didn't, if you just want to do it visually, I would say, oh, I need to be testing in this range, right? I need to pull that line up to the red line. That's pretty much a simple visual way to do it. But that being said, this is a pretty clean power curve. Now you might notice here, and this is one of the confusions that go on between the critical power model, which again was meant to show and predict performance along with CP and W. I don't wanna, and, and, and it does a, a fair enough job in that. Um, it just doesn't match up with the physiology well. And in my opinion, and I wanna start the argument, I think it tends to overestimate. Here's why, it bounces across the top. The power duration curve model is a fit model. It's fitting in with your data. So it doesn't take 
an anomaly data and change your entire physio, your entire targeting, your entire everything else. It's fitting to all of your data. So we have the most predictable response, the most predictable training targets, the most, uh, and I shouldn't say predictable, the most accurate. Okay. We also, in your power duration curve, once you've done all your testing and you've done your baseline, you've done some normalized testing, you can also look at, you can visually look at it, right? Looks pretty good. But you can also use power duration curve with error calculations for cycling in this case. And you can look at the actual variation between Pmax, FRC, and FTP. And we actually give you the plus minus watts, plus minus kilojoules and the percentage of variance. So it could be off about 1.1% on threshold for Joe Ryder here. Um, it could be off 1.4% on FRC or 2.3% for Pmax, right? So the reality is that's probably within the realm of the accuracy of your power meter, but we're actually giving you the math to check it. So it's there, it's for you, it works. Um, you know, it, it, it gives you the ability to have confidence in your model. We give you the math to prove it. When we're doing that uh, testing, not only are we establishing your power duration curve, as a matter of fact, it's the way we establish your power duration curve. We're actually looking at the main energy systems. You have two main energy systems. There's really three, but there's two anaerobic ones. So we're looking at your blue, your FRC, your anaerobic power. So see here, it's anaerobic, anaerobic power. Here's how much power this athlete is making anaerobically in the blue. The green is their aerobic power, right, in green. If you simply add these two up, in general, they equal the power duration curve. So, you know, here you have 240 watts aerobic, um, 12 watts anaerobic, 250 watts PD curve. There's some rounding in the combinations um, and a little bit of math at kink points, but you're within two watts. So it usually roughly adds up right to your numbers. Now, if you just set out and think about how your energy systems work, if I just said, all right, jump on your bike and start pedaling down your street, it's absolute bananas as hard as you can go, right? Most of that energy is initially coming anaerobically. You burn through your anaerobic very quickly. It drops off. Your aerobic system is slower to respond to the demand of exercise. It usually takes somewhere in the 32nd range to really get up to par and rolling. You have some crossover point. And then from that crossover point on, you're making most of your energy aerobically. That's what the power duration curve is. The power duration curve does not build Remember, it's the parameters give us understanding of the physiology. The power duration curve is really two curves. I'm giving away secrets here. Kevin's going to choke me. It's not that much of a secret. Most people, you know, people with the math who have really broken down the math have kind of figured it out. We're basically creating two curves, your anaerobic and your aerobic curve. You add them together and they're your power duration curve. That's why it really drives physiology. Okay. So I have a couple of questions I'm going to tackle before I go into my case study. Um, question number one, what is the end state of warm up and tests? Just 10 minutes heart rate zone, any advice? I don't have great advice for you there, Eric, because I really find that some athletes warm up very differently and it depends for the effort. The longer the effort, right? The shorter the warm up. The shorter the effort, the longer the warm up. And it really is something that I think athletes have to feel. But don't overthink the testing. I think if an athlete has a good 20 to 30 minutes with a, a warm up, a ramp, some fast pedals, a little bit of effort and work, they're usually ready to go. So that's the best general advice I can give you. Um, indoor training, would it be better for structured test? Also would like to type, would you like to type time? Also, what would you like to type time? Indoor training, I mean, I'm not sure I understand the question. Indoor training protocols are exactly the same. Don't overthink it. This is where we get in trouble, right? We're giving you a very easy process. If you're gonna do a lot, the bulk of your training indoors through the winter, do your baseline testing on the trainer following the same exact system. Your normalized residuals will be tighter on the trainer because you tend to have less variation, 
but that's fine. It just makes it easier for you to track and will be more accurate. Still just follow the system. Don't reinvent the wheel. It's a really, really good, simple process. For longer duration tests, it's hard to tell an athlete go max. They always want to target tricks. Yeah, great question, Serena. I think once the time goes over, let's say eight minutes, 10 minutes, it is hard to say max for an athlete. What I will actually do is give my athlete, this is a personal tip to a good, let's call it 20 to 30 minute test. I give them a target power just under what I think they can do for about the first three minutes. Then I tell them to open it up from there because I know if they don't go too fast in those first couple of minutes, they're going to do well. Now, I don't want to hold them back too much, so it's dangerous, but I might say, like, if I think the athlete's going to achieve a 300 watt, uh, 30 minute, and I'm just keeping the math simple, I might say, you know what, I want you to go out in those first three minutes and try to target like 285 to 290, but once you hit three minutes, turn it up to what you think you can hold. Most athletes in that time, but once they get into like that three, four minute range, their body's telling them what they can do, and they've, they've gotten over that adrenaline and the hyped up feeling of testing, and they'll settle in nicely from there. Next question. Yeah, actually, Serena expanded that question about is smart trainer. People ask me this question all the time. The question is, especially when they want this on a smart trainer as a structured workout. When I, in my training plans, it, all my training plans are structured and then they get to a test day and it's not structured. We always get tons of emails. My test day isn't structured. I know, because I want you to go max. Just gave you some good advice. Next question. Should I test for short duration while focusing my training on extensive aerobic? So this is it, right? This is what I'm saying. And this is where we get lost in the sauce. So the question, I'm going to repeat it. And Jorge, I'm not trying to make an example out of you because this is the confusion. I just want to be really clear so I can help you the most, right? Your question is, should I test for short duration while focusing my training on extensive aerobic? Yes, the model needs a, a maximum short, medium, and long for it to be accurate. So without the maximum short and medium, you might be targeting the wrong numbers. You have to maintain the model. My advice to you is simple. Do a baseline test, a full baseline test week. Testing is training, training is testing. You're fine doing that. Get your model up and established, then do the unstructured format. Don't keep reinventing the system. It's less testing. It's less testing than any other system, unless you just chose not to test in any system, in which case, just ride your bike. <laughs> There's no use following a system if you aren't gonna test your improvement. So it is a great question. It's fair, Jorge, everyone asks me that, but that's the exact point of this webinar and understanding the process. If you follow the process, it'll give you intensely accurate targeting. If you don't follow the process, it won't. Sorry, fair amount of questions, but it's best to tackle them before case study. Steve, um, Steven, thank you so much for all your support in the Facebook group. You answer more questions than me. Um, how do you make an athlete to understand that even if he, she wants to be a super time trialer, TT -er, maybe his, her physiology is an all rounder or something and just avoiding max short and mid efforts is not the right way to train. I see this a lot in the Facebook group. Steve, you're absolutely right. You can't take a non-sprinter, somebody without a lot of fast twitch muscle, and no matter how much you train, they're never going to be a top-end sprinter. Their sprint might improve, but you can't be something. All of our cycling realities basically were given to us by our parents. Now, I'm not saying you have to have some super high VO2 max to succeed. You can have a lot of success, which was that which was dealt to you. But the reality is you're not going to change it dramatically. You can improve areas, and I actually have that in my case study, so I'll go a little deeper. Steve, how do you make them understand that? As a coach, when I run into that, I'm just stone blunt. Sorry, this is who you are. And now, I'll support you if that's still what you want to do, but just understand your physiology does not match your goals. And if they still want to go forward, I just go forward. I'm, as a coach, I don't believe in... in, in forceful motivation of athletes. I find that I believe it works better if they have their own motivation and I'm there to support and empower it, sometimes with brutal truth, sometimes with support and rah-rah, sometimes with, you know, 
uh, emotional and, and moral support. <laughs> All right, one more question, then I'm pressing on. In terms of the model, what's long, what's medium? So Dennis, a good question. Use your normalized residuals to determine what's long and short. This one here on the left, it tells you, look, short, medium, long. We literally give it to you there. So just follow that system. There's your short, medium, and long. Running with power, same testing protocol. Yes, I would. Steve, I will give you guys another little secret. We're working with uh, uh, some of the, the best running minds out there in power training. Um, Kevin and I are, 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 are cooking up a little, little November uh, release that is going to give you some better and deeper insights into running and running with power. My personal belief, I'm not a runner. So in the Paladino Power Project is a great place to ask that question or ask it in our group. Steve will answer it. Um, I believe the same protocols. I think what I see the most wrong with people running with power, they don't do the short protocol. They don't do the sprint or the, the one minute effort because a lot of you know distance runners just don't want to do a five, 10 second sprint, right? So, but I still say the same protocols work. Okay, pressing on now. Thank you everybody for patience. Here's a simple case study and it's only a couple of slides. It's going to be simple and I'll pick up some pace here. This literally is, this is Rebecca Durrell. Rebecca's one of my athletes. She's the British national crit champion, pretty good pro who's now about to become a mom. Greatest story in the world. She, COVID shut down. She's always wanted to have a baby, decided to get pregnant and her team still supported her, gave her a contract for next year while she'll have a new found baby. That's awesome when brands and companies go out there and do that. Um, kudos to them. This was her last year testing. So if you look what I wrote, there it is, right? I had her do some endurance. We were doing some riding coming in. There's your one, two, three, four. Banged it out, had to fit it in her schedule a little bit. You see here, we're doing our season planning. This was obviously a year ago. This is her actual schedule week. And I show this as a case study because um, the it's important to know that I practice what I preach. So while I was talking, Steve Palladino, who's the king of the power training for runners said, yes, he would apply the same protocol, the test protocols that I just went over for runners. Here's the trick though, right? And here's what I want everybody to do. The problem with your power duration model when you do a baseline test is it's using the trailing 90 days. And based on the time, the length of your time off, you could be carrying some max data from the end of your season. So for the first 30 days, I'm always doing these three time frame, these four time frames. It's usually only three. It depends on a Monday. This week is blank, right? But uh, I'm using last week last 30 and last 90 days, I overlap them. I'm looking at, look how much for, this is Emma, Emma's a pro with uh, 2020. Um, look how much her numbers really different in, in those 30 days. She hasn't done any formalized testing at this point or whatever. So this is just giving you the example. Here's why. If the 90 day is way higher than last week and the 30 day, that, that's usually a pretty good indicator that they are, um, it's a pretty good indicator that they are holding over uh, some peak maximal value from the previous 90 days. And again, I want to remind you, if you're asking questions in chat, I'm going to ignore them. I see alerts coming up that people are chatting. Please put it in the Q&A. So what you really want to do, it's so important during that first 30 days you've got in your baseline, because there's a little bit of art to this, right? The baseline test, you know, is their current fitness. So you might want to look at just last week. As a matter of fact, I find myself usually using that. I still look at 30 and 60 to see if there's some residual effect or something I want to carry over. But the reality is I'm just using this week or last week, depending on what day it is in the week. Hopefully that makes sense. But it's really important that you do that because you can see how much variation in the new baseline testing can happen. Normalized residuals. This is my normalized residual chart. I just put a negative 7.5. I actually do put a positive 7.5, right? And I don't want anything in my normalized residual below. Actually, I don't want it above either. I want it to be within that parameter. So I just have a 7.5 low, 7.5 high. I took a quick visual look. If it's in there, I don't feel compelled that I have to test immediately. Now, 
if I'm looking at doing some max efforts and stuff like that, and I see, I'm like, maybe I'm about to prescribe some one minute intervals. And I see this athlete needs to take a 65 second, you know, they have a low 65 second normalized residual or even a 20, 30 second. I might say, Hey, knock that out first, do a hard one, roll around for a couple of minutes, then finish your workout. Yeah, that's a great simple way, oversimplification almost to blend it into your workout. That's my simple case study, right? Three rules. And what I'm trying to get, and you can even see with some of the questions, don't overthink it, keep it simple. There's no magic bullet of complexity, there's nothing. If you just do the simple process, you'll be shocked at how well it'll work. So Nate asks, if the normalized residuals are 7.5 or plus, what do you do? Well, that's where I would test. So Nate, that if you looked at it here on this chart, that would be like this really low point. I would, it would be telling me here. I would then use that as a reason to execute. Well, I better test that now, this week, this seven to 10 day cycle, you know, depending if you're block training or what. But that would, once they go over seven, then I'm like, man, I need to get to that. I need to get that to that like right now. So that's what I would do. It just triggers me, hey, make sure you do the test. Excuse me. So anytime I see that go over 7.5, I know I need to look at the athlete's workout and see if I can't squeeze in a max effort. Okay, great questions. It really, I think helps everybody learn. Thanks everybody. But now I need to pick up the pace. That's okay, I get through this section fast. Lesson two, using WKO to better understand your strengths and limiters. So if you've, uh, listen to me talk about training. It really all comes down to ability. The rider demanded the event. Let's talk about step two, establishing that strength and weakness uh, factors within an athlete. I actually have a pretty deep webinar on this, so I'm going to gloss over it, but that means your power duration profile, your power duration metrics compared, power profiles, which is a little bit old school, but still works, strength, weaknesses, and limiters review. So all I'm gonna do right now is take you through some charts. Um, up top in all the power duration charts, right? We have this in your profile and you can find profile. If you don't have profile dashboard open, you know, and this is a dashboard. So this is a dashboard, but this is one open. You can go to cr open an existing dashboard. My little arrow got moved there. Search profile and open it. The power duration profile has a full power duration line of performance ranking. I almost hate saying the word ranking because we over really, we want to overly rank ourselves, right? And if you zoomed in on it a little bit, it could look like this, um, you know, and you could pick a point. And here's why this is important. Even though I do suggest looking at the old power profile where you have five seconds and one minute and 20 minutes and something else, right? What I, uh, why just look at those four or five time ranges when you can have every single time range? That's all this is doing. It's giving you the same view as those four points, except it's giving you second by second, not exactly second by second, it's logarithmic, but generally second by second across all time ranges, right? So everything you wanna see, that really gives you deeper insight into the athlete. Now, I have a little confession to make. I don't use this chart at all. Um, well, I, I take a quick look at it, but I don't use it at all. When I'm looking at an athlete's strength and weaknesses, I look at something else, which I'll get into in my case study. This is the right below this is the uh, PD metric profile. So here you can see Pmax, FRC and FTP. Um, so that, uh, you know, is right there and rankable. Now, I'm showing Joe Ryder, so a male. If this was female, the standards would be the female standard. So it knows the gender because in the athlete details, you set the gender. So it just automatically sets the gender for you. So you, if you have the, that athlete set as female, it'll show you the female profiles. If the athlete set as male, it'll show you the male profiles in all of the profile charts. Um, so here, just and the same here, male, these are matching as a male. Uh, so you're seeing the male profile, male profile, male profile. So you have power duration, you can compare power duration metrics to the database. This is one of my favorite charts, right? And this is um, 
confuses people. And this is a strength and weaknesses chart. And what this chart is doing, right, is it's looking at your curve, your power duration curve, against all of those profile curves, right, and ranking your, you, your individual relative strengths and weaknesses. So for this athlete, their short sprint is a strength. So the blue line means you're just average. It's not a strength or a weakness, it's just average. Anything above is strength. And the green lines are standard deviations. So the higher the yellow line goes up, the more it is a strength. The yellow lines, kind of like orange in this picture, are standard deviations of weaknesses or limiters. So the further the yellow line, this yellow line goes down, the weaker you are. People ask us what the index is, it's nothing. You have to have a, a Y and an X axis to make a chart. So we just, it's just numbers. Pay attention to the green, blue, and orange, right? This is time, this is the logarithmic time. So starting at zero second or one second and going out to this athlete for about two and a half athletes. So this is, a, this is a strength and this is a strength, but this athlete has no dominant strength. And this is a limiter right around 40 seconds, but still not a killer limiter. And it's to no surprise, the athlete's phenotype is an all rounder. This is a really great chart. I'm actually gonna show you this in my one case study slide. This is against world-class um, chart. And all this is doing is if you go back to that power duration curve and this, you take this world-class line and your power duration line and measure the distance between, and this is what you get. So this is, the red line is relative to power duration. So this athlete comes closest, and I know it keeps saying Joe Ryder, but I can't guarantee it's all the same. This is my sandbox like, play data. So this athlete comes closest in the 50 to one minute range to world-class and is definitely way off world-class by five hours out, right? <laughs> now the green line is what happens if we age adjust. We're simply using a formula for decline in power by years. So that's all that is. Those two charts, this one and this one are the two I use to look at athlete strength and limiters. This is the old fashioned power profile. Nothing new here, this goes back to the old one FTP and the old systems and the profile is still available for you to use, but I don't understand why somebody would want four or five elements when they have the whole curve. Up to you. So here's my one slide case study, right? This is literally how I do it. And I, it's so funny, right? Data helps you make decisions. It's not the decision. And it's so important that you really wrap your heads around that, um, it's so important that you really wrap your heads around that, that uh, you, you know, you are able to do what I'm about to say. Sorry, I was reading the question there and distracted myself. Um, this athlete underneath, I should have not had these circles here yet. You can see that they have a limiter in their sprint. They get stronger when it comes down to the short to mid range stuff and drop off, right? So the reality, this is actually a, a female pro cyclist that I started working with a couple of years ago. And this was, um, sort of what she looked like back then. It's kind of funny. I'm just looking at the last 90 days. She's been injured this year, so hasn't been really riding and is just getting rolling again. Um, at first, her point was, I need to be a better sprinter. I'm really just, I get, you know, I can't sprint, I can't deliver, or whatever. And if you were to look at this chart, right, you would say this is the athlete's greatest weakness. But part of the art of coaching and determining and using data is never mistake room to grow for potential to grow, right? And you have to do that. You have to look at that reality is this wasn't a heavy fast twitch athlete. It, she had more room to grow here, but she wasn't a sprinter. This goes back to the point I was making earlier. When I look at these two weaknesses and I had more data, I understood, I know her muscle fiber type, you know, I knew more information about her that way her potential was greater to focus on this. It might be easy to say, man, we got a sprint, but she had more room to grow. I was able to see the underlying physiology and basically say, we could bang away at sprinting for two years and it probably won't help you win races because you're never gonna get there. Or we can really look to raise things out on this side of the curve. 
get it way up and have you start winning races. And to be honest, that's exactly what we did. I, I took her through two years of aerobic building um, and she started winning races and her sprint never really got, as a matter of fact, her sprint went down, her pure sprint went down. Um, so did this little bump, went down a little, but this potential achieved. So you as the coach, you have to look at where is this athlete's potential? Can you pull it out? And if you get that improvement, never forget this point. And Kevin preaches this to me all the time. People don't think about translating to performance enough. So you've got to translate it back to performance. You've got to translate it back to performance. So when I look at this, I was also translating back to performance. Great, we could have put 100 watts on our sprint, still wouldn't win, still wouldn't have made her a, 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 the pro she needed to be. She needed this. She needed to be able to drive and control races. She needed to be able to, to move in the pack and do the hard things. So you make that decision. All right, before I go on to lesson three, I've got some questions building, I'm gonna take them. Is the data and the strengths and weaknesses chart adjusted for age or just gender? Um, it's in the strength and weaknesses, it's just gender, but understand this is a model of you and how you compare against all other people in the database. So don't assume everybody else in the database is young. It's really meant to show you your relative strength and limiters, but that relative is to you. It's relative to you that it's showing you. So that chart um, is you know, important that you understand it's relative to you. Hopefully that answers your question, Chris. Um, hey, Robert, uh, you can't find the chart. Yeah, it should be in the library under strengths and limiters. If not, can you email us at info at wko5.com and we'll check it and make sure we get it to you. We can push it right in the library. I'm probably there. We might have edited the name. Uh, I tend to um, look under PD curve profile strengths and limiters. That might be why you're not finding it. Use that. That's the name of it. PD curve profile strengths and limiters. Hopefully that helps. Hey, Tracy, it appears to be orientated exclusively to cyclists. Is there any comparable data that allows us to approach towards running? Great point, Tracy. No, there's not because we haven't had the time and the accuracy of power data to compile a database to compare against. It's simply, we'd be glad to do it if we could put together the data. The biggest barrier to running with power is you have different systems out there. Let's say system S, a big S, and system G, big G, right? You have these two systems out there. They're not using the same algorithm, so their power numbers can't be compared. So we would need to build a big S profile and a big G profile, which means we need twice as much data to make it active. Um, ask your running power producers to all get on the same algorithm, and we can shorten that time frame. Um, we'd be glad to do it if the data was there. Okay, pressing on. Poor Kevin, I'm sure he's sitting back there trying to get a word in with me. Kev, uh, anything you want to add at this point? I'm sorry if I'm just rolling along at pace. Uh, I'm just, uh, uh, I'll let you, let you roll out. I'll raise my hand here if I got something. Got it. Okay, rolling in. Lesson three, establishing your training targets. And this is the last lesson, then the others are in part two. So this is probably the key point, right? And you see me talk about this in the Facebook group and this and that, so I'm gonna really only hit the highlights. When the original Cycling Peaks and early WKOs came out and Dr. Andy Coggin and, and Hunter Allen and, and uh, Alan Lamb and, and Dean Golich and those guys were all working on this, they came up with a levels-based system, right? A training levels-based system. Kevin was the guy who did all the work underneath. So he's the guy who programmed this and put it in your and made it all work and gave excellent insight into it. Kevin knows more about training than, than most coaches. The reality is though, when Andy came up with FTP and then he came up with these percentages of range of FTP, and I want you to understand how this was done because it was genius at the time, it really was. You couldn't have done it better. Andy's a super smart dude. Um, he looked at a whole bunch of data and he said, you know, about 106 to 120%, 
you're, that's, you're working on, that, on, on improving VO2 max. It's not really a physiological zone, but once you get over about 120, um, now you're really talking about pure anaerobic capacity. And he did it just by looking at the data. He, it wasn't, it was that type of, a, you know, ability to call a lot of data, don't get me wrong, but to then make the call, make the decision. There wasn't this look at the physiological parameters underneath, besides the fact, of course, he knew them intuitively. And it was amazing how accurate and well his system was for what he created and how he created it that way. Now, I might be saying it, you might have this image of thousands of riders in a lab somewhere. It wasn't done that way. But also, it's really important for you to understand why he did it that way. He did not expect or want coaches to prescribe workout by these training levels. So let that sink in. If you followed Andy or know all the years of discussion, he would always say they're descriptive, not prescriptive. He did not want people to, coaches to use these to prescribe because it's not a light switch. It's not like if I go 104%, I am only working on lactate threshold, but then I go 106.5, now I'm totally VO2 max. It's transitional. All these lines in between are very blurry. So we didn't want people to prescribe that way. He wanted you to be able to come back, look at a workout and be like, wow, I spent a fair amount of time banging away in this range. I was probably improving my VO2 max or I was probably improving my anaerobic capacity. But the way he came to that is he looked at a whole bunch of data and he fit this idea of functional you know, rules based on the people in the middle of the bell curve. That meant that by nature, the way it was targeted, that didn't work for everybody. It didn't. So let me show you a case study of what that means. I, I, it's easy to look at in power duration what the problem is. Here's two riders, Jane Ryder and Joe Ryder, 270, 272 threshold, right? So similar thresholds. Visually, you might be looking at these and saying, yes, they look a lot alike, right? But the reality is, and all charting systems do this, they're scaling the curve. So if I took 600 watts here and pointed it at 600 watts here, it starts to look a little different, right? So 600 watts here. Now, what happens if I um, take a look at them with no scale? Meaning I let it be, uh, I unhinge the scale to use, like I picked a maximum of, 800 watts, 1,000 watts are scaled to. The reality is, look what happens. Now you see the same curve for Joe Ryder, right? But Jane goes right off the chart. She's got more high end, more sprint, more punch, right? So when you look at the scaled version, man, they look like similar athletes. Once you unscale that, they don't. But yet, if you look at their training targets in Coggins Classic Zones, which again, don't, Andy was amazing for creating this at the knowledge you had back then. That's my whole point about people like, well, why does it change? Because it evolved. We know more now. We're smarter. We have more data. We have better analytics. We have more computer horsepower. We simply are evolving the process. But if you were using those classic systems and these two athletes, remember these two athletes doing VO2 max work, were two, Jane was 292 to 333. And Joe was 286 to 327, a five watt difference. They were that different in their athletic capability and their power duration production, but they were training at the same level. So one of these two athletes, excuse my French, was getting screwed. In this case, it was this one. Intent? Yep. You know, um, you reminded me of a story that you once told uh, of an athlete who, when they would do uh, short intervals, they would change their FTP and move it up because they weren't hard enough. And then on the days they were doing longer efforts, they would lower their FTP because the longer efforts were too hard. So they were constantly fiddling with their FTP to adjust. And uh, that demonstrates, I think, uh, the problem. And it eliminates the need to be constantly flipping your FTP around to make the workouts easier or hard enough. Uh, because it knows that you're the type of person who, you know, needs more uh, uh, or a higher target, you know, at the, at the top end or 
or a higher, you know, tar or a lower target at the, you know, long end. Yep, exactly, Kev. That's funny. I do know the story too. I didn't know who the athlete is. Um, now it's totally true. But these athletes for years, and if you're using the classic systems now, without thinking through this evolution, you're doing it. You're not training in a maximized format. Jane was not training in a maximized format under the old classic systems because Jane and Joe were training the same and for the same time targets. But the reality is, as we were moving into WKL4, um, we were looking at the database. So each one of these line is a percentage of power as a percentage of FTP. When you look at that, there's not a lot of variance. You start getting down here to about 1,800, 600 seconds, which let's call it eight minutes or less, probably more to say five minutes or less, where suddenly you see massive variation. So each one of these lines is an athlete, a clean, you know, no corrupt data athlete within the database. Now you see a massive variation. Now under the classic system, they're all training the same. And that's what needs to sink in. So when people tell me, like the question I just got earlier, do I need to test the short? Do I need to do the? Yes, you got to pick up these variations that you have so the overall targeting is better. So Kevin was telling a good story. So here's a little background how we evolved to eye levels. Um, I'll take some credit for this one. Uh, Andy and I would have this discussion about once a week. <laughs> Kevin was an excellent neutral mediator, uh, but was the empowerer behind the end idea, made it all happen. Um, I would say, Andy, you can keep saying training levels are descriptive, but every single coach are prescribing them. We need to use the power duration curve to drive the prescription and give coaches a tool to prescribe. And he would say no. <laughs> and, you know, for lots of reasons. And I'd say, okay, well, I'm going to go out and break your classic system time and time again, because I am a normalized power buster, um, time and time again, until you finally relent and, you know, do it. We went through about two months of back and forth where I would go out and do workouts, you know, a threshold workout, and then I'd go out and slam a bunch of short stuff and totally blow away. The and I had to come back and say, well, Andy, what system am I working? Was I working VO2 max or not? And of course, Andy's smart enough to know. And eventually he said, okay. And him and Kevin sat down and said, all right, we all, and it was actually me, Andy, Dean, and Kevin, and said, how do we, Dean Gulich, how do we make in this, how do we use all this? We have the underlying parameters. We understand the athletes performing uh, physiology. We understand this variance going on in all these athletes. What do we do? We created eye levels. And it's simply individualized training zones that allows you to precisely target yours. And everybody write down what I'm about to say. And you can take this as it is. That means FTP does not mean shit. Bam, write it down, take that note, fold it up. Next time you wanna have a FTP argument with anybody, take out that note and read it. <laughs> because we're not targeting off FTP anymore. The eye levels utilize now it plays off this reality, which I'm gonna show you in a moment. It does not set your training levels by FTP. So if you're using eye levels, I don't care if you put 500 watts as your set FTP, it doesn't use them. It's using your actual individualized power duration performance to give you the proper targeting for physiological or desired physiological response. That simple. Write down that note. It's funny, it's the wrong question to be talking about FTP, that's my point. Um, so eye levels, just the facts. We developed a deal with the Y variation of power I just showed you, at and above FTP between athletes to follow for a more individualized approach towards training. Um, it's also important, and I, I have a webinar on time to exhaustion, you understand how that helped us here also. So the old argument was FTP was your one hour power, right? Andy never said that. He always said approximately one hour. People who know the physiology know that you can maintain your maximal lactate steady state for anywhere from 30 to 70 minutes, where most people are 45 to 60 minutes. So once we had the ability to have this curve, have TTE, we could open up these systems of targeting of eye levels. What that is, is a new nine zone system, further quantifying the classic seven zone. 
Now that's almost too many zones. And Andy and Kevin and I ha had that discussion a lot. We don't, you don't want so many that it's too complex, but yet you do want to have, if you're going to develop a system for prescription, you need precision. And that's why we ended up with nine. Um, and that was a superior approach, we thought. Here you have this comparison of the classic levels and the eye levels. This is a great slide because it lets people absorb. You're not really changing the rules much. Now, these are more, these are all individualized more to you, but when you look at the targeting and what's it affecting, it's kind of similar there, right? But now you have sweet spots, some better variation above threshold. And the reality is, right, I get this question um, a fair amount. What about these three level zone, the simple level? In reality, you have three physiological training zones. The three zone process is physiologically absolutely correct. One, two, three, bam, 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 right? Great, love it, simple, whatever. How many coaches really prescribe in just three options, right? It is not the best way of prescription. It is an excellent analytic way right? It's an excellent way of oversimplification. It's an excellent way to understand load. But at the end of the day, as a coach, when you're looking for a prescription, you're trying to give your athlete a reasonably precise target for them to accomplish something. You need seven or nine. You really need nine. Now, here's funny. One of the things I say, it's really this, you can, the, you know, in the three zone system, I actually do use the three zone system, early base training, November, and December. I just simply have you know, really easy, sort of easy and hard, right? <laughs> Medium easy hard, I should say it that way. So you really are using the three zone system as people get up and rolling. For me, I, I have the luxury of working with a lot of pro athletes. So they are putting in bigger base and have the lifestyle to put in a lot of time. Um, but the reality is once we start getting into any specificity, you know, we're really talking about, you know, by, you know, prescribing in nine targets. So I see questions adding up. I'm going to get to them soon. So really the basic eye level solves this problem. So if you look at eye levels now, the same Jane and Joe that were here, and let's pick a, 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 a place that they're training. Um, yeah, let's look at uh, FRC for, as an example. So Joe is doing 390 to 465 watts and Jane is doing 419 to 574 watts. So what's that 105 watt swing now? So we went from a five watt swing to 105 watts. Dramatic improvement in targeting efficiency. And they added, we can give you time ranges that that athlete needs to be doing the quote unquote intervals in. What's the best range of interval duration for them to do that in? So we did eye levels because we needed to solve the issue of generalization. That was the whole purpose. But yet people want to go back to the, but I need to test my, 20, my FTP by doing a 20 minute power, taking 95% of that, and then using classic zones. Stop that. That's an excellent answer. It's a good basis if it's simple. It's not anything horrible. Do not get me wrong. Uh, Coggin and Alan did a great job of evolving that. Kevin was part of that team. Amazing work done when that was the data to have. When we set out to develop WKL4, the whole goal was to evolve beyond that. These systems, you know, we're derived about your specific energy system, and it's just a matter of, and this probably is it's a point lost. So here's another key point. I uh, only have a couple of slides left. The system evolves with your fitness. So when we're talking about the entire power duration system, so if you're using classic zones, you test once and six weeks later you test again, you don't change your zones till six weeks. If you do your baseline test and then you're on your structured I'm sorry, your unstructured testing is always kind of happening over the course of a couple of weeks, one here, one there, one here. Your training levels are changing and evolving with your fitness and really absorb how important that is because Joe Ryder's target for FRC might not be 390 to 465 next week if he's getting fitter. And then what if he's fitter the week after that? In the classic system, you'd still be prescribing the same intervals. In the power duration system, as his curve is tracking with his fitness, his training targets are literally changing in real time. Big factor. I should have made something more of that earlier. Okay. 
So now you take eye levels, but let's go even further in the paradigm. We understand key points where power and time interact. And in that interaction, we have points of inflection. We have points of waiting, points of influence might be a better word. Excuse me a sec. These points are influence where we can see in a curve that these, for this athlete, has a high impact. So if you look in your eye level and other training zones, you will find the next step available. I'm trying to speed it up a little bit. You, most people can find optimized intervals, which is where I'm going. Eye levels made them individualized, but we still needed to work on that. we still work better as a description. We really wanted to solve the prescription problem for intervals. So we created optimized intervals, right? And optimized intervals, you guys, this is my last slide before final Q&A. Because we understand these waiting points, because we have parameters, which are real physiological things under the model, we understand where the intersection of time and uh, power, duration and power would be a better word, intersect and create a point of influence on that human performance model. You're the human performance model, right? So we can really be highly specific, almost too specific in giving you a very specific time of target and a very tight range of targeting. A very tight range of targeting. So let's pretend like this was Joe. Um, and he shows you 90 days. That's a bad image by me. I accidentally must have had it correct. I always make sure it says 90 days. But um, let's say we were to use Joe Ryder again. Remember, he was doing his FRC intervals. I don't know if it's the same number I'm just using as an example. Let's say we wanted to do extensive anaerobic as FRC, pure FRC work. He needs one minute for 505 to 485 watts, 45 to 505 watts. If he wanted his Pmax FRC, the intensive side of anaerobic, and that means like intensive anaerobic builds power, pulls the curve up. Extensive allows you to hold power, pulls the curve to the right. So his intensive aerobic intervals need to be 36 seconds at 614 to 597. Now, would I prescribe a 36 second interval? No, I would make 35, maybe even 30, right? It depends on, you know, how precise the athlete is and what they're doing, but it gives me excellent clarity of range and targeting. If I wanted to do VO2 max intervals or, or, or what really is max aerobic VO2 max is not a, a, a physiological system. VO2 max is how much oxygen you're carrying, but it's not a system. Um, max aerobic, this athlete needs to do six minutes and 33 seconds between 285, 265 watts. That's where they'll get the greatest influencing at improving maximal aerobic capability. I can tell you looking at this athlete, their aerobic intervals are longer because they have very good anaerobic power. So they need the longer interval to burn off some of that anaerobic work. So we're really banging away at time at VO2 max or close to VO2 max, I should say. Now in this chart, everything to the left of the line is um, the power duration model science. Everything to the right of the line, and I almost regret doing it because it spread some confusion. Dean Golich and I worked and we just put together guidance. Me and Kevin, Dean and Andy sat at a table when we all created eye levels, then we created optimized intervals. Yes, it was a long time we were sitting at the table. Then Dean and I just added, well, what should people do? What does the science say is the best targeting? And it's like, if I had a way to put a line in that chart and put that over, I would, but just remember that reality is there. So optimized intervals. So eye levels are super clear. Um, and can be used prescriptively as a prescription, but are still really more about description. The reality is uh, optimized intervals give you the prescription. There it is. And then people ask, well, if it says do five to 10, what should I pick? Well, if your athlete can do five, do five until they can do six. Once they can do six, do seven. That's what I mean by progressive. Find out what they can do and, and, and through training, try to get them to do more. But also there's a point of diminishing returns. You know, and that's true like max aerobic. If you're trying to build your aerobic energy, let's call it that VO2 max for classic users or max aerobic capability, 15 minutes at VO2 max, not targeting a power, is a really good max number. Anything after 15 minutes at VO2 max, you start getting diminishing returns. Um, 
you might have a reason for doing a little more, but you, for it really improving your max aerobic, you get diminishing returns. Now to get that, depending on how hard your athlete's gonna go, they're gonna need somewhere between 12, because they might not be able to do more than 12, all the way out to 30 minutes. I know athletes who have to do like 25 to 30 minutes to generate 15 minutes at VO2 max. I answer that in my interval webinar. I go deeper in that. All right, lesson four, starting next week, we'll pick up with designing your training strategy. So we're gonna show you how to use data, the rest of the steps. I should have put that in here, but I'll show you the rest of the steps next week. I'm gonna now open it up to the Q&A. I let some questions build up there because I know I went long. Um, I'm gonna target questions. If you guys don't wanna stay on, I totally understand and would not be insulted. Um, John Baxter asks, why are there not eye levels on training peaks? John, I think that's a great question. Um, Train Peaks is really doing some great innovative work. You're seeing a lot of updates in, in database and strength. And uh, I know you're seeing a lot of change. I know um, that change is never easy for people, but part of that change is empowering future improvements and putting things in place to do more exciting things. So there's a vague, but not so vague answer. Um, Miguel. Running comparison, again, does eye levels work with running with power? Yeah, your eye levels should be pretty good. Um, you have some different efficiencies in running. So uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to say yes, slam dunk yes, but yeah, it gives you excellent guidance. My fear is if you're a really bad form runner, you have gait issues, you have form, you, you, you have running efficiency issues, I'd be a little bit cautious. It's easier, to, you know, it's, it, you might not fit well within that, but in general, yes. All right, Serena. When building workouts in TPWKO Builder, we still have to base targets off the percentage of FTP. Yes, okay, so you're asking the same question. Any chance there will be an upgrade in the future that we can set eye levels? Same answer, Training Peaks is always working at to keep innovations at a level, if we could, you know, and, and, and stay on the cutting edge. So um, I'm sure there's energy being put into things. Next question. If I'm training for long events, let me here move this here so I can look without cranking my neck. <laughs> if I'm, well, maybe let me put it here. If I'm training for long events and a lot of my training is done below FTP, would eye levels make a difference in my training? You know, that's a great question. Not that much is the answer. Um, I would still make maintain your model just to be sure, but I would, um, it doesn't make as much of a difference. Why? Because most of the variance really happens in the shorter ranges. Um, now, even for long events though, I'll give you one tip. Uh, Ironman and, and try is not my specialty, but my observation of looking at the data and the science, a little bit of hard work can benefit some long course athletes um, and it tends to be ignored. So knowing it, it's nice to know just in case you did a couple of those workouts, but generally no. Once you're below threshold, classic and uh, eye levels are similar, the same. Will there ever be an update to PMC on how TSS is calculated if FTP is not your hour of power? Great question, Anonymous. Um, man, I know Shane Gaffney wrote a great blog post I wrote about this. It is one of the weaknesses of TSS, right? So TSS, if you think about the basis, and I think this is the question you're asking, um, if TSS is, what, if you go at max as hard as you can for an hour is 100 points, Right? But now that we understand TTT, TTE, time to exhaustion, and an athlete might be 40 minutes, right? Do they still get 100 points for an hour? Because the reality is they'll have 20 minutes below threshold. Um, we've looked at this, and I'll give you the answer mathematically, which will be semi-ducking the question. Um, it doesn't make as much difference as you think. And over time, you would think it would have really big difference and we've looked at it pretty extensively. It doesn't, you'd be surprised. It ends up shifting the PMC over the course of, you know, a season five, maybe eight. And maybe in an extreme case, it could be 10, even though I don't think we ever saw anything like that. 
and to add all the confusion, it wasn't worth it. Um, Kevin and I, you know, we've added training impact to give you better color commentary to TSS. And I'm sure 2021 will, will hold some other fun evolution. At some point, we need a, a system that better utilizes all of the athletes' data to give us better insight, right? The PMC is an excellent tool and it will always be part of everybody's training system. Um, but maybe there's some things we can do that'll give you a bigger, better 360 view of the dose response and adaptation of training. Why Joe and Jane, why do Joe and Jane have different times for FRC workouts? Good question, because um, again, it's individualized to them. So Joe might need more length of time to actually trigger that FRC response versus Jane. So Joe might need to go hard for a little longer because, or Jane actually had more anaerobic power. You know, Joe might have more aerobic power because of the way their energy system makes energy. <laughs> I guess that's circular. You know, their ATP turnover, uh, that reality is they need different strain on the system to get adaptation. Or, or their PD curve is shifted right a little bit. But maybe that's another way of looking at it. Yeah, exactly. Good, good point. What Kevin said is the curve is shifted right. You can actually see it here. They're a little further out this way. So they're just not the same athletes. It's individualized. Hey, Stephen, can you clarify for FRC the rest ratio is um, I know there was an old chart that had that wrong, one to one or one to two. So if you're doing extensive aerobic, um, one to one, one to two is pretty good guidance. So an intensive, you want way more rest. So that, so again, think about an extensive, you're trying to improve capacity, time to maintain a power in that range. So you really only want a minimal recovery from the system. One to one, one to two, I might do one to three though. This is where it's so hard. And it's exactly why I said I almost regret writing it because you're trying to give guidance, but don't think about them as absolutes. Um, like for example, for me, I'm a pretty big anaerobic engine. When I'm training into peak form, I can flip them around pretty quick and keep, keep, keep knocking out pretty good numbers. I might need one to one, all right? But if I'm not on form or I, I, I'm just starting out, I might need the one to two. One of the things I'll, I, I will teach in an advanced interval course later is, and this is going to sound nuts, so just wait until I, we get the courses out. Um, I don't always prescribe rest as fixed as I see a lot of people do. My dependent, what, what is time in between interval, right? That's very impactful on a set of intervals, how hard you're going during the interval and how long, but also how hard you're going and how long in the, in the off time. And that's a pretty big impact. And that's why it's such a range. That's, there's a science and an art to that that's hard to put into a suggestion. So it's just good guidance. But it's one to one, one to two. Um, I know the one to 10 is out there. Um, yeah, I understand your question. I didn't fully understand it at first. Um, I like the one to 10 guidance as a whole because you might have athletes that need that long because their time is short and they're not in shape. That's where I'd love to just do away with it. It's hard to give the guidance. Sorry, bad answer, but I think you get my point. It's somewhere in that range, maybe sort of, throw a dart. It's too individual. That's why it's hard to answer the question. The full range could any, the best target range is tight, right? But it can, so one to one, one to two is my normal range for extensive FRC. So in this athlete, I would have them do one minute on, one minute off. Maybe let them rest out to 90 seconds. Probably never go to two. I know who this athlete is, so but whatever. That's my best answer. Do, I, do you have materials you can read in the work you guys did with eye levels? Um, yeah, just Google search eye levels. I know Andy and I wrote an article, uh, a long one, sorry. There's an ebook somewhere on the WKO help site. If you email us at info at WKO5.com, we'll link you to it. 
there's a there's two good articles on the Training Peaks blog. Go to the Education Center and find the ebooks in the WKO5.com Education Center. There's an ebook on eye levels and individualization, and really a pretty deep dive. Andy and I wrote that, um, and it's in there. Next question. Hey, Matt. Suggestions if an athlete has issue hitting power targets given the optimized interval target. Yeah, you know, sometimes that happens. The funny thing is, if you think about the optimized interval targets, right, the athlete has sort of done that power before. Because remember, the power duration curve fits within. It doesn't bounce along the top. That's exactly why we didn't bounce it along the top. We did a fitted model. Because that fitting means they've done something in that range. So for me as a coach, I'll give you a sort of, a, it's a good target, but look, there's days where the athlete is either, they're in a block training mode, they're, they're, they've got a certain load under their legs, they've hit a certain point where they can't deliver. It could be some type of chronic fatigue, it could be some type of acute fatigue, it could be mental barriers. I know athletes that have a really good, you know, can hit shorter workouts, but not longer or other things. And finally, it could be the modality. And what I mean by modality, sometimes it's just a mechanism of, um, are you doing it as a, a steady interval? So like three minutes on, three minutes off, or let's say four, you know, six minutes on, three minutes off or something like that. Or are you doing like 20 seconds on and 15 seconds, you know, more of a Tabata or a variable style or micro style. I think that can have impact. So those are possible issues. A better way to answer it for you is if an athlete can consistently hit it and you, let's say they're like dropping 10 watts off, but yet you, you're, you're confident they're not in an acute fatigue stage that's stopping it or in a chronic fatigue stage that is stopping it, you put those aside. I shorten the time because I want the athlete to achieve the power. So let's say it's a minute at 600 watts, whatever we have here on the screen, right? Or 505 watt or 485 is the minimal. And all they can get to is 465. I might prescribe 45 seconds in the range, let them hit that and then try to build on it. Because one reality I do know, as long as their underlying data is correct, the models fitting within what they have done, that's exactly why we didn't want to predict numbers. We wanted to make sure it was in the realm of it, what's possible. And if you showed that athlete their power duration curve at a minute and be like, look, you, you've kind of done that before and they're still struggling to achieve and you feel pretty good about their fatigue balance, just shorten the time a little, let them get their legs under that range. And that's the art, right? Again, the data isn't the answer. It just helps you make a better decision. So that's what I would do in that situation. I'd, Make sure it's not acute or chronic fatigue. Move those aside. Now nah, the training rhythm's pretty good, going well. Make sure there's no other barrier of modality or mindset or something like that. Then I would reduce the time. Or, or Tim, um, also check for technical issues that um, aren't related to the athlete. Like if they have giant power spikes in their uh, normalized residuals or out of control, if you're looking at indoor versus outdoor, um, you know, I mean, there might be some other technical reason too. Great point. Absolutely. I always answer like, I assume everybody's got, a, you know, their, their models clean. So yeah, check for technical issues. Like I've seen that I had an athlete years ago who could crush tests. Right. And, and they would do great. They were a pro mountain bike racer and just ate stuff up, man, and would kill it. And then uh, they would go out and do this one workout and I wanted him to do it on the, on, on trail, but it was like a smooth hill and he could never hit numbers. And I'm like, dude, how could you not hit these numbers? Is it the trail or you just don't like the places? Like, no, I love this climb, man. And I, I just can't make these numbers. We did about four or five of those workouts. And then finally, I came to the realization. I asked him a question. I'm like, dude, are you using a different bike? He's like, yeah. He's like, I switched my power meter over onto this other mountain bike because I'm faster. Or at least I think I'm faster. And I use that bike on this trail. And the reality was there was a, an equipment change that was creating the, we, then I said, don't change your bike. Sure enough, he goes to that trail, hits his numbers. So it could be a bunch. But in the end of the day, if you feel good about it, don't shorten the power, don't reduce the power target because he's done that kind of power, he or she, reduce the time and let them build into the time range they need to hit. 
Next question. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next question. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Matt. For your prescription, do you write the workouts in WKO and then do they sync to TP? No, WKO does not sync up. Um, it's only a one-way sync. We do this for security reasons in general. Um, it's a long story. <laughs> uh, why? Because who owns the data, right? You have a coach owning a bunch of data on WKO. They could change things and push things up into an athlete account. That could negatively impact the athlete account. They own the athlete. The athlete owns the athlete account. So the download only keeps everybody safe and clean. Um, the questions earlier was people are wondering when Training Peaks is going to have an eye level capability so that you could just simply write eye level targets in Training Peaks. And that obviously, in the name of using eye levels, would be a good next step. Um, and, and Training Peaks is always looking to innovate and do good things. I'm sure they've got some cool stuff on the horizon. Um, hopefully, that answers your question. I've not had very clear answers for you. Sorry, Matt. Bob, for another webinar, is there a dashboard with elevated corrected PD curve? Yeah, absolutely, Bob. I use elevated corrected PD curve all the time. As a matter of fact, one of the reports I have it, there's a whole thing on elevated corrected. Um, I did a webinar on it, as a matter of fact. Email us at info at wko5.com and I'll link you to it. I have a, I track my athletes starting elevation every day because they travel all over the world and I don't know where they're at elevation wise. I usually <laughs> physically know where they're at. Um, but I want to know what elevation they're at every morning because I want to know if I'm using elevation corrected or not. I use elevation correction for targeting and I have power duration curves. I have multiple power duration curves for my athletes starting at 3,500 feet and above. So it's a smart thing to do. Email us. I'll link you to the webinar. Um, I'm pretty sure all my dashboards are in the library. If not, I'll share them with you. Robbie. As a recent adopter of WKO, I have a lot of historic data to support the power duration model. However, is it worth running the testing protocol or simple review of normalized residuals be sufficient? Robbie, understand what I said. If you don't start, do the testing protocol, do the testing protocol, do it. Start a baseline or what's gonna happen, it's kind of like whack-a-mole with normalized residuals. If you don't put one week and just get them all smoothed out, just get it in the bank and get it done with. Start with the structured testing protocol. No big deal. Just go out once a day. You're doing a max effort in different range. Good wake you up. You know, it always kind of sucks at the beginning of the year when you're not in shape. It's a little uh, more painful and you don't get those great numbers to uh, egg you on. But dude, that's training. You know, the reality is you, you need to know where you're at today. So do the full structure. Then once you get the structure, you can easily maintain it with light, unstructured training. Hey, Nate, can you tell us if TTE influences optimized interval duration at all? Yeah, but not the way you would think. TTE, like optimized intervals, are uh, a result or an output of the model parameters. So they're related. One doesn't influence the other, but there is a relationship between them. So uh, it doesn't influence it, but there's a relationship between the work that you're doing and then actually the targeting, right? And then the change in fitness and the response as your power duration model changes. For athletes primarily limited by time, their CTL usually seems to hit a ceiling. Absolutely. I tend to re reference the CIL metrics in combination with CTL to track training load, uh, training load at that point. Any other suggestions? No, Matt, CIL is good. I would look heavily at the training impact there too, just to make sure you're trying to maximize time as best you can. People ask me all the time, I, I, I must be at my genetic max, right? And the reality is only a couple of uh, very, very few percentage of us, only those racing at a pro level where they have the lifestyle to train the big volumes year in and year out, ever get to their genetic max. You're simply at your time max. You're at your training time max. There's only so effective and efficient you're going to get in six hours a week, eight hours a week, 10 hours a week. 
So as a coach, you're always trying to look to maximize that. I would say one of the biggest challenges as a coach and as an athlete too, because you both go through these challenges, is you hire a coach, they do a good job, or you do a good job with the athlete, you bring on an athlete, but they can only train like 10, 11 hours. You improve them year one, maybe even squeeze a little more improvement out of them year two, but the reality is you simply get to a point where you don't have any room left for improvement in that time limitation. What I tell my athletes when they get there, mad is, here's the honest answer for you. If you're not willing to give me a block of time more, I'm not talking about one hour a week. I'm talking about, you know, a 20% improvement so we can go next level. Uh, we're going to have to be okay with this. Maybe we can work on scales. We can work on pack scales. We can work on race pacing. We could work on execution. But the reality is you will hit that time gap. There's only so much you can do as a coach. CIL tracking is great. Training impact is tracking is great. But man, it gets to be a challenge once you hit that ceiling because you want to keep the athlete motivated, but there's only so much you can do. Good questions, man. The FRC rest ratio time in your chart is wrong. It's supposed to be one to two to one to 10, according to my chart. Yeah, I know. That's what Matt, uh, that's what uh, George, that's what Steven was pointing out. There's two charts floating around out there. I expand in it to avoid all confusion. And I use my old one. All right, down to the final. You guys, if you're sticking on, you get extra credit points, but we have about eight questions left. What about time between 90 and two minutes for training? There's a water tense between anaerobic. Is it too hard? Um, I can answer that. There's other interval. Uh, uh, webinars to answer that question. Look at my building FRC and look at my interval uh, webinars. We'll really give you some insight. That's an individual question. It depends on your model. And yeah, actually 90 to two minutes can be kind of a dead zone for certain reasons. Hey, Adam, any plans in the works to plan I recovery zones um, based on how athletes clear out the system, so to speak? Yeah, dude, that's a such a hot topic and i think it's a place i know you understand it as a great coach but i, I think i see uh, a lot of room for understanding and and what i had said earlier what what adam is bringing up here is when you're planning an interval set if you're coaching or self-coaching it is as much of an impact in how hard you go during the on and how long it's as much of an impact in how hard you go and how long in the rest in between. And managing that rest intensity, that, that recovery, that, that, that off period in between, and managing the intensity and the time of that has dramatic impacts, as does the execution, the modality of the interval. Are you high cadence, low cadence? Are you, you there's all kinds of different things. One of the reasons I started that poll on Facebook and I never really followed it up because so many people, to be honest with you, were just kind of nasty about it. <laughs> I was like, whatever, I won't finish explaining it. But I will absolutely tell you, having specificity and being specific and really thinking about so many coaches just say, go 300 watts for three minutes and then rest three minutes in between. Go 300 watts for three minutes, then rest in between. There isn't cadence guidance. There isn't, because there should be neuromuscular manipulation is part of that game, right? And if you're not thinking in cardiovascular response, if you're not thinking about um, uh, preloading, aerobic preloading, if you're not thinking about neuromuscular muscle memory and fiber recruitment, you're not maximizing your coaching. And that data is there and it's easy for us. The science is out there and it's everywhere. We just need to maximize it. So Adam, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you up and we're gonna work on that one together. Um, it's been on my list for the longest time, so. You just got, thank you for volunteering, <laughs> we accept your service. All right, FYI, some links in the WKO5 was to, appear to be broken. Oh, great question. We'll, we'll, we'll get them fixed up. Not a problem. Yeah, the eBooks are all in there. The eBooks kind of got lost in the background. We'll make sure we get them up front. I can share them all in Facebook in the next couple of days too. Cause they're good. They're actually pretty good ones. Oops. Um, I think I just deleted somebody's question. If I deleted your question, please feel free to ask. 
Is there a way to track FRC by seeing when the athlete increased their FRC and whether it was done with a maximal sprint type effort versus a five to eight minute effort? How much of an impact does your phenotype have on total FRC? Can you have an athlete with the same FRC numbers but entirely different ways of draining it? That's probably too many questions to answer here, but you're on all the good questions. Let me answer the last one, right? So if you think about Pmax, Pmax is the maximal drain rate of your FRC. So you think about the very top of the power duration curve, right? So Pmax curves right here. That's the maximal drain rate. So when you say that, right, or when you think about that, then what some, and let's say then your threshold is 240. So this is the range between maximal drain rate and when you're really no longer draining. You still are, but let's just call that the one. People think if they go somewhere in half, the drain rate is 50%. There's where individualization really occurs and it's very hard to track all kinds of different variables that we literally don't have enough data to decide. All we know for sure is Pmax. That's the maximal burn rate. All the numbers in between, if you go, you know, if your Pmax is 1000 watts, you say, oh, well, if I go 500 watts, am I burning 50% of my FRC every second? Uh, per second. Not necessarily, right? It really depends on how aerobically efficient you are. It depends on how, your, your physiological, it depends on your nutrition. It depends on your, 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 the state of glucose. It has so many variables that we can't track it. I would like one of the other breakthrough sciences I'd love to target, which would give us greater insight, a more effective insight is not what impacted it, right? But would be repeatability of and the recharge rate, and in, in, it's why DFRC can be a challenge. That recharge rate is so tricky. The burn rate isn't too bad. The recharge rate just gets to be a nightmare. Now you can see impact by looking at when things changed and looking at the, what the athlete was doing when it changes. In your power duration curve dashboard, there is power duration metrics over time chart, which has like little lines. And if you see it and it's a square line, it'll block up or block down. If you look at that, when it blocks up, it was that day's workout that impacted it. When it blocks down, it was 90 days ago. Well, I shouldn't say that. It might be 90 days ago's workout that affected it. But if you're looking for the up, you can see it that way. Um, another thing, there's a fair amount of stuff out there comparing today's power duration model to your 90 day model and looking for visual you know, and mathematical variances and that is a good way to see what changed. I know Renfro, Bill did a bunch of stuff on that about six or seven months ago. I think the files are in Facebook. Um, that would help you do that. Sorry, again, not a clear answer, but here's what happens when you get these answers. There's some answers that are just, so like you're asking what increased their FRC. Yeah, you'll see it from the workout they were doing, like, but it might not be the only thing. The model uses all of the data. And that's a mistake some people make. They're looking at like this one minute power and it was just that one minute power that impacted my FRC. It's the entire shape of the power duration curve. All of the data plays a role. Of course, data in a certain area might have more weighting, but all of the data plays a role. That's a better answer. And that's why it's hard to answer specifically. Good questions, Anonymous. Robbie, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Appreciate you being on. Amber, man, this is like the pro gallery. There are so many pros on tonight, I love it. Um, is it necessary to maintain the order of testing in baseline power duration curve test week? Question mark. Did you do that for a reason or can you flip things around the specific athlete? Great question, Amber. That's a really good one. I actually meant to say that. I had it in my notes and I remembered not saying it. So I'm scrolling back for the answer, but the answer is it is not imperative that you do them in order. I think in the baseline testing, as long as you get those four test days in a seven to 10 day window, you're in good shape. That's the beauty of the flexibility here. It doesn't have to be, I got to do this and, and a five minute and then a 20 minute and then just need those maximal efforts in about a seven to 10 day window and you're in good shape. Now your baseline's established, you can move on to unstructured testing. So did I do it for a reason? 
Um, yeah, I did believe in general that your uh, when it comes to that time of year, like you know your baseline where eighty percent, ninety percent of these tests are done, kicking off the season. This is the data I really want to make sure in this time range is that's the max. And then if you're wearing down a little bit, then I can slip in the rest day. It's easy to come back after one rest day and knock out a one minute, take another rest day and knock out a sprint. So I wanted to kind of get these in while the athlete was most fresh. But feel free to jigger, add rest days, whatever, as long as the four tests are done in a, in a four to 10 day window. If the athlete's a good block trainer and wants to do all four in a row, great. Good question. Robert, how do you intertime the tests into the timeline? So what I do, right, I should have done a slide on this. Um, so let's say you have a four week cycle. I'm trying to look at a calendar. And each, you have a four week cycle, right? And you, I've done my baseline testing and that was last month. By the time I get into my second training cycle, I might always do my long test in week one. I do one test in week one of the cycle, right, ap right after the rest week. And one test in week two, and one test in week three. I try to sneak one in, like every week or every other week. But that's the point, right? By, and I'm not sneaking in a test, I'm just prescribing a maximal effort. Now, would I do that in the early base periods? No, I might stretch that out to six to eight weeks. That's why it's a little variable, right? I know the aerobic side, we're not doing a, by the time we get more into the, the, the peak performance phases and we're really tuning towards what you might call a build or a peak, yeah, then I'm doing at least short, medium, long, short week one, medium week two, long week three, whatever. I'm not being specific there, but each week I'm doing one of those maximal efforts if I can, when it really matters. Now have a racing that's a racer, an athlete that's a heavy racer, that might be enough but don't forget, in racing, you really don't, you rarely, you don't have as many absolute maxes as you think. So that's how I blend it in. Sometimes, you know, like I said, in early base, it might be out to two cycles. I spread, you know, I just spread them out. I don't try to do all three tests in the same day. I don't even try to do all three unstructured, short, medium, long in the same week. As long as you're just kind of sprinkling in there and going on, you'll be in good shape. That's why it's so simple. Good question, Robert. Coberto. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Adam volunteered. You <laughs> be careful what you wish for, Adam. Um, Tracy, since this is the last question of the night, since data is not available to do a good pulled athlete comparison, would you have other recommendations on how to determine strength and weaknesses for runners? I don't. I have some really good ideas on this. And like I said, we're doing some work that were some things we we're gonna come out with in November with, with uh, Steve Palladino and Steve Bateman and some other volunteers working in our group. Um, so there's gonna be some evolution in that. I don't have enough running coach background. I used to be a runner, like so many of us cyclists, I come from that side, but I don't have the coaching background to give a good recommendation. Um, I would post it in the Facebook group or post in the Paladino Power Project, Steve is probably someone who can give you a much better answer than me. Awesome. Great engagement. Man, I love the questions and answers. I love that so many people are out there really learning and understanding. That's what's going to make you faster. Not a new aero frame, not new tires. You know, learn how to coach, how to train better, and you'll get faster. Thanks, everybody, for a great session. Really appreciate it. Have a great night. See you next week.